All right, hello. Uh, hopefully the stream is up and running now. We are going to start in another minute or so. We're giving it a little bit of time to make sure people are trickling into class. Do you have uh, class? Yeah, we have class right oh, now. Oh, I'm time to leave. Oh, we're done at 7.30. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yep, yeah, we're gonna just give it one more minute and then we'll get started. Um, today's lecture is gonna be about pen tools and vectors, but we'll start in just a second. We're gonna go ahead and get started then. So welcome to week four. Today is one of my favorite lectures. Um, it's pen tools and vectors as well as user research and user testing. Um, I think there's a lot of really, really relevant content today um, to any kind of part of the design process. So um, the user testing, user research bit will apply to basically any kind of design work that you want to do in the future. Whereas pen tool is gonna be hopefully exciting for you if you've ever been interested in illustration, graphic design, anything like that. Um, all right, so again today, these are kind of the four topics we'll be talking about. In addition, we'll talk a little bit about masking and Booleans, which you might have seen. There's a couple of like basic problems that those things are going to be able to solve, especially with illustration. Um, so we'll be doing that and doing a little bit of a demo at the very end. But before we dive into that, I was wondering if anybody had any questions about components or about the last homework. I know that last lecture was pretty dense, and so if you had anything that you're confused about, whether it's about variants, components, any of that good stuff, um, composition, spacing, feel free to speak up, raise your hand or anything. If you're in the Twitch chat, um, one of our moderators will be um, able to answer questions, or you're more than welcome to send them into random on Slack later on, and I'll get, uh, do my best to answer them really quickly. But. Yeah, any questions about anything that we talked about last week? Cool, Twitch chat, I can't see you, so if anything's going on there, feel free to keep going. But with that, we're gonna go ahead and dive into um, the attendance form and the lecture file. So the attendance form and the file are gonna be at the same uh, basic links at the, every week. This week it's bit.ly slash fd sp22 lecture four. Let me know if that doesn't work, but it should be up. Um, and then the lecture file similarly will be at figma decal dash lec4. It's always going to be these same basic formulas for each of the links. Let me know those are, if those are uh, working or not. And thank you also for, for braving the cold and the rain <laughs> to coming to class today. No worries if you're not. Cool. Are those uh, working for anyone? Links? Okay, awesome. All right, then we'll go ahead and get started with today's content, starting with user research. And Celia today is going to be teaching um, the user research and user testing parts of the lecture. So take it away. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Cecilia. I'm one of the TAs on course staff. And um, yeah, it's really nice to be meeting you. And today we'll be talking about user research and user testing and some of my favorite parts of design. Um, and so just as a little bit of preface, um, these concepts I'm going to be talking about next don't necessarily, um, like, they aren't directly tied to, like, specific, like, tools you'll be using in Figma, um, but like Ace mentioned, they'll be really relevant for um, any sort of like design process or design work you'll be doing in general. And I think that people come in to design if they don't know anything about it, um, thinking that it's all about like creating things um, with like tools, things like Figma and Illustrator help uh, manifest those into reality. Um, but there's a lot of groundwork that goes into design um, behind and a lot of that is encompassed in research. So um, what is user research and why does it matter? Um, essentially, like I said, there's a lot of groundwork that goes into um, designs before they come into being as any sort of product or creation. And 
User research is really um, what lies behind all of that. It helps designers um, study their users and look at their behaviors to understand their needs, their wants, their pain points, um, what motivates them, what you know, like what helps them be engaged with products. Um, and essentially, what we're trying to do at the end of the day is to empathize with users and then understand what needs they have, why they're not being met, and how we can try to meet those needs. So. Um, when we're conducting user research, we implement a variety of different methods to help us like identify these gaps in, um, in user needs and try to create solutions to help them out. So um, there are a couple methods that we implement in user research, um, and um, they all fulfill some sort of different kind of way of identifying user problems. And here are a couple of <coughs> excuse me, here are a couple of the main ones. So um, if you've ever been asked to fill out like a Google form or like a Qualtrics survey, um, surveys are really important um, and really widely used um, uh, ways for um, designers to collect research. And that is super helpful when you're trying to collect mass quantities of data from really large populations. Um, so if you've ever um, answered the like, uh, the UC Berkeley, what is it like the pulse surveys? Um, those are like they're trying to get uh, they're trying to get like mass quantities of data from the entire UC Berkeley population. Um, another example of when you might use a survey um, was a project I was involved in um, that asked uh, where we were trying to like collect uh, people's general opinions on um, like different types of medicines and prescriptions and supplements. And so we just created a Google form to send out to people and ended up collecting hundreds of responses because we wanted more generalized responses to be able to quantify. Um, so that's basically surveys. I'm sure some of all of us have filled them out at some point. Um, the next method of user research we're gonna talk about, which is pretty common and often goes hand in hand with surveys are interviews. Um, so interviews uh, are typically one-on-one -on -one just conducted with the designer and another participant and um, surveys are like the, the point of surveys is basically the opposite uh, or sorry the point of interviews is basically the opposite of surveys we don't necessarily need a huge amount of data but we're trying to collect stories from people collect opinions um, make sure that we um, are learning about what motivates them as a person and so um, for example, in this project I was working on, uh, I wanted to get to know about uh, people's individual experiences with doctors and medicine and supplements. And so um, once we collected all this mass survey data, we um, looked at the responses and see who had a lot to say, who had maybe controversial opinions. Um, and we just pulled out some like storylines and edge cases, and it gives uh, a, it it supplements surveys um, in giving you a really abundant amount of personal um, information to work with. Um, of course, surveys and interviews um, don't necessarily have to be done in conjunction with each other, but they often are. And next, uh, we have the contextual inquiry. So that's essentially just you um, being an observer, observing your users in their natural habitat. Um, for example, um, if you're looking at um, how you're, if you're a professor and you're um, looking at how your GSIs run their lab sections, um, you might enter or you might just sit in the back row of a classroom and observe how they're running discussion or lab. Um, obviously, like they might act a little differently if they know you're there, um, but that's just what a contextual inquiry is. You're just observing a natural habitat and um, observing how people behave in it. So the next thing we're going to talk about are pain points. Um, like I mentioned, the point of user research is to essentially identify users' needs and the um, pain points or the needs that aren't being met that might cause them to essentially like feel irritated or make it harder for them to navigate through the product or whatever they're working with. And so we sometimes call pain points bugs, but essentially these are the problems that users face. And um, as designers, it's our goal to alleviate these pain points. Now, um, spotting pain points uh, is really easy when a design is bad, um, but we want to make sure, I think the end goal is that we wanna make sure that users can not identify pain points. Think of really bad apps you've used. You probably notice all the things that stick out like sore thumbs, but when you have a good app, um, nothing like everything seems more seamless and nothing that's like going wrong is as noticeable 
Um, and so we have um, to like sort of put into context like what can be a pain point. Uh, my answer to you is it can literally be anything. Um, you see the like hierarchy of needs um, here, and I think that like uh, you can sort of like start from the bottom and say okay like people have physiological needs or pain points if they aren't getting access to food because they live in a food desert and don't have um, access to public transportation or a car one of their pain points might literally just be like access to groceries and food um on like a more uh like uh on a like a less large scale level someone might realize that like um they really hate um, they really hate the way that like their coffee maker makes a weird sound when they make coffee and they like grind the coffee beans and that could also be a pain point for them because it's not aligning with their, their ideal expectations of how like this product might work. Um, we also have things in between like all of you are familiar with how bad the campus Wi-Fi is um, and that's a pain point for us if we want to do any work on campus or we have Zoom classes that we're trying to do on campus. So these are all pain points and um, to be a pain point anything just needs to be uh, a problem you're running into that um, could be fixed or could be alleviated. Um, a couple other uh, examples of pain points I talked about um, the internet issues that we've experienced. Um, having like poor lifetime tracking for uh, buses and trains. Um, so, so if any of you use like the transit app to track when like different, different buses are coming around Berkeley, um, you might notice that they don't always sync in real time and so that can cause you to miscalculate when you need to leave your house or you might miss the bus. Um, and that can be really inconvenient for us when we're trying to get from place to place. Another good example would be um, having a website organization that is just simply like um, not ideal. So in this case, you can see um, everything is super cluttered, all the text is crushed together, there are images overlapping, um, it's really hard to parse out um, where you need to click to do anything, it's just like a sensory overload. Um, and so uh, you won't be able to access the information or get to the place you need to be on this website. So how do um, user needs tie to pain points and bugs? Um, Essentially, when you identify a pain point, you can say, okay, this need is not being, um, sorry, you can say, okay, this is clearly an issue for the user. Um, how can I take this fault and translate it into something that I can work on providing a solution for? And that's essentially what we're doing. We, for example, have no internet or really bad Wi-Fi. Um, and the user obviously is like experiencing an inconvenience because of that. So then you can pull from that pain point and identify, okay, what is the need here? Well, the need here, because we have bad Wi-Fi, um, could simply be better Wi-Fi um, or having access to a sort of a space with a different Wi-Fi connection that has good Wi-Fi. Um, or perhaps um, in the case of like Zoom, a uh, way to call into a meeting instead of using an internet-based method of like chiming into meetings. Um, so it's things like these that um, help us identify, uh, or sorry, rather once we identify pain points, we're able to sort of translate that into needs. And that uh, sort of leads us into a space where we're not like trapped by things that are going wrong, but rather we have the potential to fix them. And we can frame um, questions that we want to solve instead. Okay, so I know I threw a lot of information at you about different user research methods and um, stuff about user research, but does anyone have any questions? All right, um, if there are no questions, I can move on and we can talk a little bit about user testing. So um, what is user testing and why does it matter? Um, so let's say you've done a lot of research and you come up with some ideas and now you want to see if your ideas actually work. Um, so let's say you've built perhaps some sort of prototype, whether it be for an app or a machine or um, like uh, anything that you just created. And um, once you've created that prototype, you want to conduct some testing to get feedback on how your product or your design works. Um, and so essentially, uh, you are 
sort of like beta releasing your product into the wild to test for its functionality and maybe some other things as well, like its aesthetics or uh, how much people like interacting with your design, um, things like that. So you're able to observe how your users might um, interact or engage with your prototypes. And so you can sort of draw from that and say, OK, like this is how I think my design is working. This is where it's going well. This is um, what people are not like uh, clicking with yet. And so you can take that information, um, reframe what your user needs might be and your, their pain points might be, and then you can sort of refine your, um, your ideas a little bit to create a design that works better for your users. So a couple methods of user testing. Um, uh, we'll go over a couple. Um, the first one is concept testing. Essentially, um, that's just creating lo-fi or low-fidelity prototypes of your initial concepts to test. So that's like essentially using really um, low cost or low energy materials to create a mock-up of whatever your design might be. So for a lot of um, app designers, for example, that might be like a paper prototype where they literally just sketch out on paper the screen they want their app to have. Um, or in this case, it looks like you're trying to package um, some seeds or something, and so you might like use like paper bags or like cardboard um, or like other cheap materials to construct packaging solutions for your seeds. Um, essentially, you just want to create like, uh, like a very like, initial version of what you want your product to be at its final stage. Um, another method of user testing is called A-B testing. And essentially what that is, is you're creating a couple prototypes of what your product might be. Um, and you'll be able to compare those two against each other to see which one works better, to see um, what users respond to better. Um, an example of this would be um, Netflix. So uh, for, for when you're watching Netflix, you might notice that um, you might get advertised a show and it has like a certain shot that uh, it like it advertises to you when it suggests like a movie or a show to you. Um, other people might get a different um, like shot of the film to be recommended to them. And um, what that essentially is for is um, Netflix does research into like what their users are specifically watching and they say, okay, like frame A might look better for users that watch more comedies or rom-coms or um, frame B might look better for um, users that watch like more horror movies or action films. And so even if they're recommending the same, uh, the same title to you, they might try to frame it differently by using like different images to draw you in um, and they'll see what you might respond to better. Focus groups um, are sort of like uh, interviews in that they're about like face-to-face -face interaction, but um, obviously instead of an individual, you're going to have groups, and so that's just a way to direct a sort of organic conversation about a group of people's uh, opinions on a product. All right, so I talked about the Netflix example a little bit, um, but A-B testing, like I mentioned, is creating two versions of a prototype and seeing um, what works better and what pulls in users more, what addresses more user pain points. So um, the, uh, this, uh, the text doesn't uh, exactly match, but um, a lot of you might watch Stranger Things, which is a really popular show on Netflix, and you notice that they um, have a ton of different examples for how Stranger Things might be advertised um, to like any given viewer. And so the reason that they came up with all these screens is because um, they might say, oh, like, um, like um, in the top like, left corner, like it's a bunch of like kids doing to screen. If you have like a younger audience or aiming towards, um, they might be more inclined to watch um, something with like these kids featured on it. Um, some of the like some of the screens. Um, there's like a giant spider thing on one of the screens. Like if you like to watch like horror movies, like that might be more your taste. And if Netflix has been noticing that you've been watching horror, you might um, be advertised with that. Um, with that snapshot instead, or um, on the right in the middle, um, there's two people, they look like they're about like teenager age, so if you watch a lot of like teenage movies or like rom-coms, they might like advertise stranger things to you with that screen. Um, and so 
yeah, they might do something like that, and they also might find that like some of their screens just like don't work at all, um, or some of their prototypes might not work at all, like any of the uh, examples that don't have people featured on them. And so, yeah, essentially, like you have all these like different groups of your users, and you can build a different types, uh, or you can build a different prototypes to see what people might respond better to if. Um, there are any trends overall, or if there are trends um, between like subgroups of your users, and you might find that like nothing is working uh, too well, and that will just give you insight once you have like uh, things to compare relative to each other. All right, so um, a little bit of terminology time. Um, I've been talking a lot about user testing in um, in the sense that it is a method to help you test your designs for their functionality and um, for like how well users respond to them. Um, and so that's sort of an umbrella term. Um, a subcategory of user testing uh, is called usability testing. And usability testing is pretty specifically focused on how functional your product is. So um, really just like, does it work? And how does it work? Um, can users intuitively like navigate through it? And if it works, then um, that's essentially what you're testing for in usability testing. So um, some usability testing methods are um, the following. So first click, so it essentially um, tracks where users first navigate to when they enter an interface. Um, screen recording or just like real life recording tracks like, um, it looks at like how users like navigate with um, a given product. Um, and uh, yeah, so it'll just record how they navigate with your prototype, um, and you can draw insights from observing them. I think it's like a little bit, um, I think it's really similar to a contextual inquiry in that you're just like noticing and observing how like, a user might interact with something. Um, a five second test just uh, tests like the information that users can remember after um, like just like looking at a prototype for five seconds. You might like ask them a couple questions um, about um, about the prototype and see what they remember. And then um, paper prototypes, which I mentioned before, um, essentially when you are building products, you might just like to sketch things out on paper beforehand um, to have a very vague, generalized idea of what your product is, and um, people can still give you feedback on it or like pretend to interact with. So a lot of these methods, or I would say like all of them, are pretty uh, like most heavily used in constructing like digital products. Um, and apps, um, but these are definitely transferable to like other types of design as well. Um, I would say especially like the paper prototype when you can like literally just sketch things on paper or um, the recording when you're like recording either on a screen or just like with the camera you can see like how users interact with the product. Um, one sort of final takeaway about like user research and user testing um, is that um, there is like a lot of like design theory on like how the steps of a design uh, process should be laid out, and so you usually start with like um, user research, understanding more about your users, asking questions, identifying their pain points, um, and then like sort of gathering and synthesizing those insights, and then you start coming up with ideas, and then. Um, selecting some ideas to prototype and then test. Um, and so that is like a pretty linear way to describe how uh, a design process for something could work. But I would say that you should probably um, expect that your design process is not gonna follow that exact, those exact steps. Um, it's not linear. Um, while those steps are there as guidance, they'll probably change a lot. Um, so for example, like on a project I was working on, long after I had done um, research and synthesis and came up with ideas, uh, the people I was working with, um, or rather like our clients for the project, asked us to entirely reframe the scope of the problem. And so we had to go back um, and come up with new, come up with sort of a new problem space and do a little more research and do a little more like ideating beyond that. Or you might find that you've built prototypes already um, and you found that your prototypes are just like not not doing well at all in the user space, so uh, or during your usability testing. So then you might want to go back to um, the ideation stage, or um, even earlier perhaps, to come up with something new for when you're designing new prototypes. Um, 
that aren't like your old prototypes at all. Um, so just remember that bumps in the road always come up, and uh, they doesn't they don't always follow an exact timeline um, for uh, the steps of the process that it might follow, but. Um, yeah, it's important to always be flexible um, and understand that um, yeah, being flexible can lead to really helpful key insights um, and improve your designs overall to help out your users. All right, we're going to move on to vector networks and pen tool. Yay! Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you to Cecilia for teaching. This is our first time teaching for the Z-Cal. Please give them a little hand. <laughs> um, I think they've done a great job. Um, and I also want to really emphasize that while user testing and user research are things that might not seem super obvious right now, especially with a lot of the homeworks being kind of like, here's a task. Meet with your lab group and do this, do X, Y, Z. We do have the midterm prompt being announced next week. You're going to have two weeks to work on this midterm. During those two weeks, there won't be any other homework. Um, but with this midterm, we want to give you an opportunity to explore the entire design process that we, as we've talked about. So you know, we've discussed you know, what is design fundamentally. We've talked about typography and color. We've talked about now user testing, user research, and then more um, technical things like composition and spacing. So understanding all of those things and bringing them together in this midterm project is going to be something that we really, really want to focus on. Um, so do keep this in mind. Think about those strategies that we've talked about. Think about what you might have also heard about before. You know, another valid form of user research, for example, is just standard research, Googling things, looking at competitors. That's another great way to understand the playing field, understand what people's needs are. Um, so just as a heads up, like why we're teaching you this, do keep in mind that we have a midterm coming up that will be um, kind of evaluating these skills as well. Really quick, um, I heard there's a couple of Twitch issues, so I'm just going to check this um, to see if this is correct. Um, but I am not totally sure why there's a couple of audio issues. Um, but this might mute me. It looks like that has muted me. Um, hopefully, this goes all right. I'm not totally sure why this might be happening. I will turn the sensitivity down a little bit. Hopefully, that fixes it on. Twitch. Twitch. Apologies for those watching on Twitch. If you hear any kind of echo, um, it might just be a technical issue for this week, and hopefully it will go away in the future. But with that, we're going to go ahead and talk about vector networks and the pen tool. Um, this is one of my favorite personal lectures because I really enjoy using the pen tool. Um, have any of y'all used Adobe Illustrator before? Just show of hands. Okay. The pen tool and Figma is different. <laughs> so just as a heads up, if you are familiar with using it in Illustrator, you might be more comfortable with a, uh, a tool called the Curve tool or the Pen tool. Um, and the strict pen tool that um, is actually named pen tool in Illustrator is closer to what you might see in Figma. So we'll be diving a little bit into all of that. So vector graphics is something that you might have heard us mention before. We talked about Figma being a tool for collaborative design, especially prototyping and vectors. Um, the idea behind vector graphics is that you use math to make all of your shapes. What you might be normally used to is raster graphics. You're talking about how many megapixels is this? You know, how many uh, pixels wide is this? With vectors, um, you are able to resize to any kind of size um, without losing any quality or becoming pixelated because all of those curves are defined very clearly by equations, by some kind of math, which means that you don't have any lossiness. Um, in contrast, applications that you might have heard of like Procreate, um, Photoshop, Clip Studio Paint, the stuff that you would do like painting in or anything that you would do kind of standard drawing in with like a tablet to the iPad or tablet to um, the computer. Those are typically raster graphics. You put down, you know, one stroke of paint and those pieces, those particles of paint are going to stay where they are. Um, and if you resize them, the particles have to kind of resize with you. Vectors, on the other hand, math, a lot of clicking based things. I really like vector graphics because it doesn't really require any kind of other equipment. You're able to use just a mouse, just your touchpad, just your trackpad, and make really, really beautiful work. Um, there's not really a necessity to have, um, say, an iPad or any kind of tablet. So vector graphics are basically math, just remember that. Um, and if you ask, you know, what do vector graphics look like, you're going to get a lot of answers. Um, there's not really a single style that you can say is like vector style, because vector graphics are more of a medium. In the same way that not all oil paintings look like the same genre of oil painting, not all vector graphics look like the same genre of vector graphics. Um, so up here are a couple of different examples. Um, these are all clearly, they all clearly look quite different in style. They all have different kind of moods and 
elements to them. You see that some of them use heavy use of strokes, some of them don't use stroke at all, um, some of them have different color palettes, um, but all of them uh, hypothetically were created in some kind of vector um, program. This was kind of hard to look for because a lot of um, non-vector art may have the same general idea. Um, but the guiding principle around these is that it's very based around shapes and line as opposed to a lot of things like blending. Um, so you might think about like, oh, the standard textile of art. That's typically vector graphics for a couple of reasons. The resizability, meaning that it can show up on any size screen really easily. Uh, a lot of it is very modular. We have like building blocks and pieces of things if you've ever seen like picaroos. Um, so vector graphics, while they are common in like tech art, quote unquote, that isn't necessarily the only kind of visual style that you're going to see. Um, just something to think about. We could have a whole other lecture about this, but we're not going to. <laughs> Um, so when you want to create vector graphics, you're going to be using the pen tool. Um, it's the icon that you'll see kind of across other platforms as well. It uses this kind of fountain pen icon, uh, which is also really interesting because you don't really use fountain pens anymore. But anyway, the pen tool is going to be um, in that top toolbar. It's one of the only tools that we haven't discussed yet. Um, you can access it by clicking the icon or just with the shortcut P. We talked about before in week two about the pencil tool. The pencil tool is shift P. It's located under the pen tool, and again, if, if you recall, um, when you use the pencil tool, it actually you know, smooths everything out into vectors, like we discussed just now. Um, the pen tool is basically giving you full control of where all of those points are going. So as soon as you click on the pen tool, your workspace is going to kind of change the mode that it's in. If you see up here in the top left, there's no longer the standard tools. You don't see the hand, you don't see the, um, the square for the shape tool or anything, and you don't see comments. This is because when you start using the pen tool, you enter something called vector edit mode. As soon as you enter vector edit mode, you can only interact with the single vector network that you have um, uh, selected at the time. This idea of vector networks is really unique to Figma. And what it basically does is says that as soon as you're in this mode, when you're inside this network, anything you put down will be treated as one network, which is one object. So if you put down you know, 2,000 different points in the singular network, once you escape vector edit mode, once you kind of exit and go back to the standard editing mode, that whole set of 2,000 points is going to be treated as one object. It gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of modularity in the way that you approach how you make your illustrations or how you make the work that you're doing. We're typically going to just say the word vectors instead of vector networks for just simplicity's sake. Um, but keep in mind this idea of vector networks is pretty unique to Figma and there's a lot that you can read or, or learn about it as well. If you're in this mode, if you decided, hey, I'm done, um, I don't want to be in vector edit mode anymore, I want to go back out and interact with everything that I have, you can press the done button that's right here, or you can press escape. Once you again have entered vector edit mode, anything that you put there, even if they are not touching each other, is considered a single vector network. So in this example, I have you know, basic lines that make the word here and there, but you see that it's just vector one. There's not two separate vectors, and there's also not eight separate vectors for all of the different letters in the word. Because this is within one network, they're considered one item. As soon as I exit out of it, it's gonna have this really big rectangle around them indicating it's one object. I can't move them closer together unless I enter vector edit mode again and move the points within the network. So again, once you exit the mode, it's going to be treated as one singular object or one singular layer. Um, notice that when you click, um, once you place that first node, um, which I've mentioned a couple of times, the node is basically an anchor point. It's any kind of you know, point, if you think about algebra or any kind of math that you've done before. Um, it's always going to be indicated by a white circle with a blue outline. Um, if you're interacting with them, it'll invert the colors, meaning that you've selected it. So it would become a blue circle with a white outline. Um, and then by default, once you click a second node, it's going to place one line that is a black one-point stroke. Um, you can edit the stroke in the future. We'll talk about this in just a moment. Um, but any time that you put things down, it's going to by default be these like, little nodes with black lines. If you place a node that closes a shape, uh, you're, you're going to see on your cursor a very, very small black dot that indicates like you're closing the object. Closing the object means that you can now fill it with color. You can fill it with an image. Um, it basically just means that, like, hey, it's a closed shape. There's not like an open opening to it. Um, again, if you're familiar with Illustrator, you don't have to worry about that. Um, or if, even if you do a fill on an open shape, it'll just kind of make up that final line. Um, but in Figma, you do have to worry about it. Um, so just make sure uh, a lot of the time, if you're ever doing an illustration and you find that, hey, this isn't coloring that I need to color, it's probably like two pixels off. It's just, just barely not touching. So just make sure that your shapes are always closed if you want them to be closed. 
Um, if you, you know, make a first vector network, if you've gone through that whole process, I have that here, there network that I saw earlier, but you want to go back and edit it, uh, there's a couple different things you can do. You can select it and just double click, you can select it and press enter, or there's going to be a square vector network edit mode option in the top of the bar, which I can show you just now. So, yeah, I'm going to go through the process of making a basic vector network. I'm going to go ahead and press P. I'm going to put down one node here. And you see, as soon as I click, my whole toolbar changed. So I'll do that one more time. I'll watch up here and then watch this whole section. As soon as I click, that toolbar changes. I have this blue line indicating where that line is going to end up as soon as I click again. So I click again. I click again. And then if you look at my cursor around the edge, you're going to see a very, very small black dot indicating this means I'm closing the object. If I put it right here, I'm not closing the object anymore. If I put it here, I am. So I close. And then I press done. And then if I click away from it, I want to edit this again. I can hover on it, and I can click on this um, vector edit mode, edit object button at the top. Um, you might have noticed now that this kind of section of the toolbar is reserved for like conditional tools that only sometimes appear. Um, so like the component tool appears here again as well. If I'm not clicking on anything, it shows the name. But since I am, I can go into vector edit mode. If I click this again, I'm back into this mode. I can actually you know, move different points on my vector. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see that kind of one pixel line. Um, and I can also delete nodes. So if I decide that I don't want this point anymore, you just press backspace and it's gone. Something else that might come up is if you are putting down lines, let's say I just want these two lines, I want to get rid of this. If I press escape once, it'll like, kind of detach me from the previous node. Otherwise, it's going to always have me like, pulling this kind of thread. Throughout. So if you want to cut the thread, if you want to stop adding nodes that touch each other, just press escape. Cool. Um, we talked about shape tools, and this is the very first week. Surprise, shape tools are also just special vector networks. So when you make any shape tool, you're essentially just creating what is a preset set of nodes and lines um, that you can then edit in the future. Note that if you edit them, you're not going to be able to use those fun, smart shape tools like we had before. You will sometimes still be able to um, modify the corner radius, like the amount of roundness on the uh, corners. But the kind of fun stuff like in the start is going to go away because it's no longer following its strict um, basic like, guidelines. I will say I don't know if they appear if you make a perfect star, but I don't think they do. Um, but again, if you want to enter vector edit mode on an existing shape, you can do the same thing just by clicking on the edit objects um, button or just double clicking into it several times. So just to show that and prove that I'm not lying to you, I will click here, go into the ellipse, and then make a circle. Uh, if I click this, I can now see there are four points. Um, and these are connected by curves, not straight lines, obviously, um, which we'll be talking about in just a minute as well. But if I wanted to modify this, if I want to screw with it a little bit, I can you know, move it here. I can even delete that. I can even delete this one singular point. No, I can't. I don't know why it's doing that, unfortunately. But you should be able to model. It is doing it. <laughs> because that one point is gone. Um, you see, it confused me because um, the whole fill disappears as well. So this goes back to the idea of um, you know you need to have some kind of closing of your object in order to have any fill on it. Um, so if I make the circle a little bit thicker, it'll be a little less um, confusing to me. I can then modify this. I can put this here, and I can put this here. Um, and then you'll see that I don't have any of the fun um, requirements anymore, or any of the kind of the fun anchors. But I can still modify the circle. Um, so you saw me just now modify the thickness of the stroke really quickly. Um, the stroke is going to function the same way it does on any other kind of object, any other shape. Um, you can have all of these different properties. Firstly, the color. Um, the entire object must have the same stroke color, um, but it can have different fill colors. Um, we should be able to just click the lights there. Um, but yes, um, the point is the stroke thickness. As I mentioned before, by default, it's going to be one point, one pixel. Um, but you can make it as thick as you want. The alignment, which is center, inside, or outside, you might have seen this just now when I closed the shape, that um, it kind of didn't appear where it normally was. So right now, by default, because this object is open, it does not have a quote unquote inside or outside. It only has center alignment. But if you look here in the panel, I don't know if the text is too small, um, it does actually say inside, which means that as soon as I close this object and I give it an inside and an outside, it's gonna pop the stroke inside um, of that fill. 
So if you see here, now it's aligned with the inside of the semicircle. If I were to change this to say outside, it's aligned with the outside of the semicircle. Um, this is going to affect a couple of things. So first is the size of the object um, is still dependent on where the path is. The path is those sets of like actual lines that make up the shape. Um, whereas um, the kind of out actual like edge that you might want to be considering, especially if you're aligning objects to each other, um, is going to be impacted by um, the kind of stroke that you have as well. So given this, again, sorry about the lights, um, I can change this to center, inside, or outside. Um, and the center, as you're going to see, it's going to be um, on both sides of the path. The cap, join, and dashes are three additional stroke properties, which you might have like seen if you're just exploring around with things right now. Um, but the cap is going to be the ends of the lines. So by default, Figma allows for a normal uh, cap, a um, rounded cap, a projected square cap. So basically, it goes a little bit further than the edge of the path. And also two arrows, just for fun. Um, the arrows are going to be helpful for things like diagramming, um, or if you just need to like point at stuff. The join is where um, the two angles meet, where there's going to be a couple different things you can do. You can have it be a rounded corner, or you can have the line be, you know, um, basically a sharp corner. And then the dashed lines is going to let you um, change if it's a dotted line or not. So really quick, I'll just show those things. Um, on this one, let's see if I can actually adjust the um, join. So if you see here, there's three different versions. I'll zoom in really close. The first is the standard kind of sharp edge. It's going to give you like the exact angle that it would normally be. This roundedness is going to round the outer part, not the inner part. Um, and then this is going to give you like, I think it's like a miter angle. Uh, it's basically beveled. Uh, if you've ever been familiar with like PowerPoints, you see a lot of bevels on things. You basically cut off a 45 degree um, corner. I don't know why this is super standard. You will basically never see this anything, but it is an option. Um, but I typically will use either rounded or um, the sharp edge. You can also have the stroke style be solid or dashed. And if it's dashed, you can modify how many you know, pixels apart things are. So I could have this be dashed. I can say that the dash is uh, 12 pixels with a gap of you know, 90. And I have this really, really strange shape. You can leverage this to your um, advantage a lot of the time. If you like math, you can, for example, make a clock face. You can kind of see where I'm going with this, uh, with kind of the dashes on the clock. That's one way you could do it. Um, or you can just use it as a normal dash line as well. Cool. Any questions about those stroke properties or anything thus far? Any terminology that has been confusing that I haven't explained? Sweet. This last thing, I'm losing it over this because this was a very, very new feature and I have been wanting this feature forever. But basically, this is the standard for you now so you get to have this. You should feel spoiled because I was working around this for so long. But you can basically fill parts of a shape um, to your will. So if you have a single vector network that has a whole bunch of different closed objects inside of it, you can use one of the internal paint uh, the tools within vector edit mode that's called paint bucket and this is going to allow you to color certain parts of it you can now also color certain parts of it different colors which is the new update that i am super excited about um, and being able to color them different colors means that you have a lot more flexibility and basically um, control and customization over the vectors that you make so say for example i'm trying to make one vector of an apple that has the apple, the leaf, and the stem. I can now draw it in one go, have the whole vector network, and color the apple red, the stem brown, and the leaf green. Um, so those closed sections, as long as they are properly closed, um, can basically have their own color, gradient fill, or even, or just be empty. So really quick, just to show what that looks like, let's make one really strange looking vector network that say has like all these different separate triangles in it. These are not touching each other, but they are, again, part of the same vector network. If I say done, I can modify all of their fills at the same time. So if I have all of their fills start at white, and I make all of them have a five-point stroke, what I can now do is go in. I'm going to press Enter to enter vector edit mode. This is the paint bucket tool. I think it is this shape because it's a paint bucket tilted 45 degrees and half full, but I think it is a strange icon. Um, but you'll click on it and you can go ahead and you know make some of these empty. Then if I decide that I want some of them to be a different color, I can go to the selection tool or the move tool. Um, select this whole section. Once you select it, it's going to be filled in with these kind of di diagonal lines to indicate that it's been selected. I can click on this one and then make the fill you know, a different color. 
And now I have this kind of weird smattering of four triangles, all of which are a little bit different. And if I click on this whole object, underneath selection colors, um, you're going to be able to see all the colors that you have selected. And under fill, it's not going to tell me what color it is. Uh, the fill is going to be a little bit confused here. If I click plus, I can make them all consistent. But you see that the two empty ones are still empty. Changing the fill is not going to affect whether you have empty sections. It'll just uh, unify all the colors you have selected. Um, but yeah, this is a really interesting new feature that lets you have a little bit more control and customization. But just remember that if you were trying to color parts of your object, but not all of it, you can press B. Cool. Um, you might have seen just now also I selected the selection tool in order to select one of the triangular regions, but not all of them. You can use the selection tool with V or with the icon within vector edit mode. And it has basically the same properties. You can move individual joints. You can move whole paths. You can select um, by doing the click and drag. You can select by doing um, control clicks. Uh, you can duplicate things as you see right now. Um, and you can flip things horizontally and vertically. Most of the things function the same way. I will say the only things I know that you cannot do are you cannot rotate while you're inside of vector edit mode. That would be really confusing. You can rotate when you're out of it. Um, so if I select this whole thing, I can still rotate it while I'm out of it. Um, but I cannot go inside of this and just rotate this one triangle. It's going to be too hard. You also have a little bit of a difference with the Alt option dragging. Um, so normally, if I just take any object, you know, if I start clicking on it, if I press Alt now, it'll still let me kind of duplicate it. If I let go, it'll go away. If I press it again, it comes back. But if I'm in vector edit mode, it is a little bit more strict. I would have to select it, press Alt or Option first. So I'm clicking it now. And you see that that cursor changes into, um, it, it kind of has like a double cursor on it now. So when I let go, it's just the black. When I click on it, it's black and white. And now if I drag it, it's going to, oh, look at that. Isn't that fun? <laughs> if I drag it, it's going to duplicate. If I'm not dragging it, or if I'm not clicking it yet, and I press Alt and Option, it's not going to appear. I think this is just a technical limitation. It could be a bug, um, but just something to keep in mind if you're ever doing this. Make sure that you're pressing Alt before you start dragging it in order to properly duplicate it. This is so much fun. I didn't know it was going to do this. Um, but yeah, other than that, selection mode is ultimately pretty similar. You can, for example, use Alt and Option to check the distance between different points, um, which can be helpful in the future as well. Any other questions about the vector, um, basically vector networks or the pen tool? No worries. Yes. Cool. Um, I'll just run through a couple of other quick examples of some of the things that we've talked about. Um, but I have been kind of showing you as I go. So one other thing that you might consider is if a line crosses over, this does not exist as a node necessarily. If you look at this, there isn't a white dot here. However, I can still fill these two regions with different colors because Figma can identify, hey, the lines are intersecting. These are separate closed regions. So if I go to the paint bucket, I can click here and make this one color um, and not affect the other side, even though there is no node. Now, say if I want to actually move where the intersection is, um, I will have to, oh, actually, it added it for me. <laughs> so I guess as soon as you um, add the fill, it's going to treat it as a separate region. So when I move this particular node, this entire line is not going to move, uh, but this part of it will. So you see here that it's not going to modify the whole line. It's only modifying where that one corner is. Whereas if I click this, all four of the paths that are touching it are going to move. Um, sorry. So something to think about there is this idea of like, if things are connected together, uh, how are they going to move together? So any node, if you move it, all the paths that are attached to it will move, um, but nothing else should be moving. If you are, on the other hand, to select an entire region, so if I select this whole triangle and then I move it, anything attached to that whole region will move. Um, the same goes for a particular path. So if I select this path, it's going to move anything attached to it, um, but like this line is not attached to it as well either, um, so it's not going to move that. Um, and then finally, whenever you see these lines, you might notice that if I'm on a straight line, um, it'll show me a little dot in the middle of it. This is just a handy trick so that if you need the center of a line, Figma automatically gives it to you. Um, so I can just go ahead and click there. Clicking it is going to make it real, so it stays when I click out of it. Um, but otherwise, when I hover on these, it doesn't actually solidify them until I select it. So given that, I'm able to just move these out, do whatever I want here, um, and then modify those lines as I need to. 
if I want to add a line, say, in the middle of it, I can just go to P, go to the pen tool, add another node right there, and it's going to let me do that. Um, so if I wanted to do, say, this, um, these are going to be intrinsically connected. So if I click on this, it's going to move all three of those. If I click on this, it's going to move all three of those pads as well. Awesome. These are the kind of bare bones of how the pen tool works. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break right now. I know it's been uh, a little bit longer than we usually go. And then we're going to talk about Bezier curves, which is just curves. Bezier is just the guy that invented them. So we'll take a three minute break and come back to talk about Bezier curves as well as masking and Booleans. So we take until 7.03. So I'm going to go back to the pain point slide. Um, yeah, what was the question? Or the one before? Oh, okay. Okay, so it is around 7.03, I know this is a short break, but we're gonna, uh, go, go, gonna go ahead and just keep um, trucking along um, with the last couple things that we wanna talk about today. So going back to where we were, um, basically this is how I feel about the pen tool in general. I was relying a lot on Adobe Illustrator um, prior to switching properly to Figma because it had a nice pen tool and I didn't feel like learning the Figma pen tool. It's not that bad. And in fact, when you can stop paying for Illustrator and switch to Figma, I think it's very much worth it. Um, so I do not like Illustrator anymore, but I do like the Figma pen tool a lot. And if you are familiar with the Illustrator pen tool, um, I think the transition will be a little bit easier for you as well, but I don't think it's super hard to pick up. Uh, one of the nice things about the Figma pen tool is how much control you have over all of your curves. Um, so Bezier curves or Bezier curves, or I don't know how it's pronounced, named after this French guy that's here, which ironically this image does not use vectors at all. It's a very much rasterized image. Um, but they were basically used initially to design cars in the 1960s. So when you think about this um, history behind it, um, it's very much aerodynamics. It's very much talking about the math behind curves uh, beyond just like the basic general shape of things. Um, and so the way that we can think about them now is creating really smooth and also scalable curves. So because they are very much around math, you're gonna see a lot of um, these kind of tangential lines. So calling back to like high school geometry, um, this idea of, you know, how do we put these anchors or how do we put these points to have a relationship with the path they are creating? And I promise this is not a math class, just kind of understanding conceptually how Bezier curves work. Um, so for any intents and purposes in this class, you can just think them as a term for any kind of vector curve. It's just the proper name for them. 
So whenever you have these kind of line segments and paths uh, with a Bezier curve, these are the kind of the different icons that you're going to see. Um, so the difference between a normal path that is a straight line and a Bezier curve is this addition of a handle. So there's usually one or two handles on it. If there's no handles, it'll be a straight line. Um, but the handles are how you add, change, and manipulate both the angle and kind of the intensity of the curve. They are always shown again as tangential to the respective nodes. So in this example, I've got this kind of hill-shaped hump. At the very top of it, you see a center aligned node um, with the two handles coming straight out of it. Um, some things to note are they are the same, sorry, I'm doing this like I'm the curve. Um, they are the same <laughs> length, and so the curve is equally like aggressively curved on both ends. The intensity is the same on both sides. They're also a perfectly straight line, so it's a perfectly tangential um, particular kind of curve. Something to note that you might have seen me do also earlier is if I have a circle um, and I go into it, um, you're going to see that these handles are always going to be perfectly straight. They're always going to be um, exactly at like 90 degree angles to each other. That's how you get that perfect circle shape. Um, you can probably talk about the math of this as well, like how far um, the handles go. But if I were to say elongate the circle into an oval, um, it's going to change. So the handles are now going to be the same on the top and the bottom, but the two on the sides are now elongated. So the distance of those handles is kind of dictating the distance of the curves as well. So if I were to take this handle, if I select it, and kind of drag it downward, you can see how that affects the actual shape of this particular circle or of this particular oval. Um, so a little bit more about um, what these terminologies are. The line itself is the path. The node, as I talked about earlier, is going to be a blue lined white circle. It's going to be flipped if you have it selected. I know that no, uh, Figma shows it just really, really small, so it's going to be a little bit hard to tell, but if you're not working in blue, you can usually tell. And then the handle is going to be dictated by tangential lines with diamonds. Um, so the diamonds are always going to be representative of the handles, and again, it has the same schematics. If it's flipped, then it's selected. Um, it's generally a bit of a trial and error process. There's only so much that I can really tell you verbally about how to make these curves beyond just practicing with them, which you're going to get a lot to do with this lab and this homework in particular. I will say that the best way to practice any kind of curves or any kind of vector art is just tracing stuff. So tracing things is going to give you that uh, intuition about, hey, how far do I drag this handle? How much do I have to um, you know, bring it, um, how far away should all these different nodes be. Um, just practicing a lot is going to give you that intuition for actually doing this. Um, so you might have also seen that when I entered vector edit mode, the whole right sidebar changed. Um, so that actually introduces the vector panel, where the top right section is going to tell you the x and the y position like it usually does, um, but also this item that says either no mirroring, mirror angle, and mirror angle in length. And so like I talked about earlier, if I'm, if I'm kind of the, the, the curve, um, no mirroring is going to mean that my two arms can be as you know, different as I want them to be. I can put them anywhere, um, and then that is going to be you know, any kind of unpredictable curve. Mirroring angle means that they always have to be, you know, the same. Um, or mirroring angle means it's always going to be a straight line. But the two, I can't make my arms longer and shorter. This is a terrible analogy. But they're always going to be the same line. But I can kind of move them in and out on how far they're going to be. That's what I was doing earlier with here, where these are still vertical lines. But if I drag it, you see that the um, the angles are going to be a little bit different. Um, and then mirror angle and length is generally the default, where both of them are going to be the same. So if I do this, it's always going to be turning the same way, and after the length is going to go in and out like that. I'm sorry, Twitch, if you can't see my, my arms, but just imagine I was doing that. Um, again, with these three, sorry, these three particular styles or kinds of mirroring on the vector panel, mirror angle and length is going to give you the smoothest curves. Um, no mirroring is going to let you even do things like having a corner. Um, so if I have no mirroring, Let's say that I move this all the way over here. Oh, I'm sorry. I move this to no mirroring. I can actually have like a sharp curve, sharp uh, corner here. So this is not going to look like one smooth curve. It's basically going to treat it like two completely separate objects, or not objects, but two completely separate, unrelated paths. Um, so if I were to put this here, you know, it's going to make this kind of fun shape. But it is going to be a hard corner here. It's going to be a hard angle where um, the kind of handles are reflected, or the the handles are kind of um, in kind of conflict with each other, I suppose. Cool. Um, sometimes you also might want to connect multiple line segments. Doing this with overlapping paths, like we talked about earlier, isn't going to do it automatically. Um, if you 
yeah, these having these two lines are not really related to each other yet. But if I add the node in the middle, um, you can think of them as the pieces of thread now being tied at a knot there. So any kind of vector path that you put down, you can think of as like a piece of yarn. Um, and then adding a node means that you're tying it somehow. So if I have the two lines like this, um, these two lines again, not related to each other, I can move the two pieces of yarn however I want. Um, but if I add the node in the middle where they intersect, um, these are now knotted together. I, didn't, I clearly did not intersect them properly. Um, but if I were to add them, you, you see that um, just barely, the lines are going to turn red when you're hovering on them. Uh, I'm not sure if you can tell super well, but this line is now turning red. This line turns red. When I hover over both of them, they're both going to be red, uh, but it can be a little bit difficult to tell. So I'm going to add that node. And now when I move them, they're going to all interact. This might also happen to you sometimes where you think you've intersected them, but you haven't quite. This is also a common reason why your illustrations might not look the way that you were expecting them to. So I'd be careful with that as well. So this is honestly just like the quickest possible tra crash course of vectors. Like I didn't really actually show you me making any vector curves. Um, I'll do it in a second. Um, but if you are personally really interested in illustration or if you have a, like a lot of stake in making icons or that kind of thing, I would recommend actually just Figma's own work on vectors. There's not any better way to learn other than practice, but these videos do give you some practice in, in like learning about the techniques behind them. I think vector networks have way more random shortcuts and random tricks than you would expect that you can pick up by watching these videos that I can't really tell you in one list in class. Um, but we highly recommend that you check them out if you are interested in illustration. We don't dive more into this because some people who take this class just don't have any interest in it, so we don't want to take up way too much time. But if you like this, week nine is all about illustration. We'll be, we are going to dive into it for those who are interested in case that's kind of a reason why you took this decal. Um, so any questions about vectors, Bezier curves, any of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If I wanted to fix this, I think the easiest thing to do is just to apply mirroring to it, which is not going to actually do it immediately. But once you apply it and then you move the handle again, it'll kind of realign them. Um, yep, for sure. Any other questions? Can you show us what the last one does again? The, the side to uh, yeah, mirror yeah. angle and link. Yeah. yeah, so this is also, if I'm going to click on it um, and I, I modify it again, you're going to see that the, the length of the two handles changes, even if I'm only just moving one of them. And this is going to give you the smoothest curve because it's basically um, identical on both ends. Any other questions about kind of the terminology around this? Cool. Um, as a little bit of a heads up, this week's lab is going to give you a ton of practice with this. It's going to start with like a worksheet, basically, for you to practice where to put the lines down um, and where to kind of move your handles. And then we're going to go into some basic like illustrations of tracing fruits and things like that with basic shapes. Something else to keep in mind is that to actually put down a handle, you saw earlier that when I was adding straight lines, I would just kind of click, click, click. Um, but if I want to put down a handle, I would just click and drag. That's because that's going to um, basically where I initially clicked is where the node is located. And then where my mouse is hovering now is where the handle is going to go. Um, there's a couple other ways to do this where I could also click and then modify the handle. Um, but both of these are valid ways to actually um, basically put down any kind of curve. And if you notice also in the top, uh, top right right now, by default, it doesn't actually tell me what it's doing. It says no mirroring, which is a lie, but if I let go and I go back and select it, um, oh, it still says no mirroring. But by default, you're going to notice that it actually does mirror the angle. Otherwise, it would give you kind of a, it, the, the re, there would be no reason to have it you know, do that as you go. Um, so it does mirror the angle by default. I believe it does mirror the length. It's a little bit hard to tell right now. That might be conditional on some other things. Um, but just playing around with this and getting a feel for like the tension of the curves almost is going to be, again, the most helpful thing for you. Um, just going to take a moment right now to turn the lights back on. I don't know why they do this. Great. I guess we don't get to be happy. Um, we're going to move on to the last section of today's lecture, so apologies again for the lights, but hopefully at least this is a little bit brighter. 
So the last thing we're talking about today is masking and Boolean operations. Um, basically a way to do more complex shape interactions and also go about making some shapes easier than if you were to go in and make them with a pen tool. Um, so what are masks exactly? They're kind of what you might expect them to be. They're a way of hiding or showing different parts of a layer with shapes like a stencil. So if I were to um, you know, have kind of this window shape that I want to move around and I can only see what's on top of that window or below that window, that's kind of how you can understand a mask. It's like a stencil, it's like a cutout. Something with like a hole in it where you can only see what's underneath that hole. So any shape group, Boolean group, can be used as a mask. In Figma, the shape of the bottommost layer is the mask, which is a little confusing because you might think of masks going on top of something. But, oh well, Figma has it so that masks are at the bottom, and they mask everything on top of them. So this is going to be important for the layer order, just understanding where to put your masks. Just make sure that you remember it's bottom up, not top down. All other things that are outside, where that mask is, is going to be hidden. So note that everything um, doesn't have to necessarily be grouped, but it's going to kind of enter this mask group as soon as you apply it to the mask, so that if I have another object that is like physically on top of it, but it's not inside the grouping, it's not going to matter. It's not going to be masked. Oh, did you have a question? Okay, no, sorry. Um, but yeah, these are useful if you want to do something like cropping. Um, so if you want to crop, crop, crop this picture of the cat into a circle, I could put a circular mask as kind of a container or a window or a porthole or something where I can only see that part of the image. So how do we actually want to use them? Um, the main way that I would recommend is um, just getting the image or getting whatever it is that you need to mask and then making the mask separately outside of it, putting it on top, um, and then clicking on the um, masking icon. And you can see that you have to have this added step of moving the mask underneath whatever you're masking, which is a little bit confusing because you won't be able to see the mask once it's underneath, but that's just kind of the way that Figma works. So I'll go ahead and show you what that looks like. Let's import some random image from my computer. Sure, hopefully it's not too incriminating. Um, here's, here's a picture of me and my friends. I'm going to put this in here. It might be really, really big because Figma doesn't actually give you any kind of indication of how large something is. Um, and I'll put this in here, and let's say that I want to have a smaller rectangle of this, or actually let's do an oval, let's do an oval where you can just see us. So I'm going to make this oval, I'm going to click and drag, um, kind of over our faces, and then what I want to do is, if I take these two objects and just go ahead and mask them, it's going to mask the oval onto the size or the shape of the picture, which is not what I want, I want it to be the opposite, so I'm going to take this, send it down, and then select both of these layers with the mask that I cannot actually see anymore. And then I'm going to mask, uh, sorry, I'm going to mask them, which is going to actually give me what I want. So now I have this picture of us as, uh, inside of the circle, or inside this oval, and you can see it's in the mask group um, with the image above the ellipse. And so whenever you do this in Figma, it is going to give you this kind of handy like arrow that tells you what it's actually covering. Um, and so to prove the whole idea of like, just because it's on top doesn't mean it's masked, if I put this right here, I can still see the whole rectangle. It does not matter. Um, but if I actually drag this rectangle to be inside of the group, um, it's going to be cropped at the edge of the circle where you might expect it. The layering inside here does still matter. So if I were to put this underneath the picture, I won't see the rectangle anymore. The picture is now physically on top of it, um, so it disappears. Um, but yes, if I want to drag this rectangle back out, I would. Uh, I think I actually do have to use it in the layer panel. We're doing this not enough. It's going to just be underneath the mask somewhere else. Um, but if I drag it out as um, the layer itself, it's going to kind of pop back out here, and I can now interact with it. You can also have multiple layers, like I just mentioned, be masked, where I had that rectangle and the photograph. It's the same basic idea, um, but if I were to go ahead and do this all at once, um, let me show you how to unmask this. Um, the easiest way that I would unmask something is kind of just pulling them back out. Um, and then I can click on this again, and it's going to unmask it. So if I have multiple objects, so let's say that I want um, all of us in the picture, move that to the top. Um, that trick that I just did also is the brackets. Using the brackets is going to be basically that you send to the bottom or send to the top, um, which you can also do by right-clicking and saying bring to front, bring to back. Um, the handier part of this, they don't actually tell you, is pressing Control or Command, and then the brackets will let you move it one down, uh, which I find really, really helpful. Anyways, I'm going to move this here, and let's say I want this picture of us, but I also want like this square from the tree, and just, just that. 
Um, if I now select, select all of them, if I move the image to be on top, um, oh wait, sorry, I don't, I don't want the square of the tree. I want the, the, the square um, just kind of crop. Maybe you want to, okay, let's say that I want to center one of my friends. Sorry, I hope they're not watching this. Um, if I mask this now, uh, the rectangle is going to exist in here as well, again, right underneath. Um, you can, again, select uh, shift, so, uh, select as many items as you want as well. But anyways, that's the general gist of masking. If you ever need to crop, say, like a special shape that you created, um, masking might be the way to go. If you ever need to just have images like that, masking is probably the way to go. Um, a similar phenomenon happens within a frame, where if I have something inside of a frame and I drag it out, it's going to clip away, um, where you can see that. This is actually a pretty good setting on frames, calling clip content. And if I unclick it, I actually see the outside. It doesn't mask anymore. But if I do clip it, which is the default setting, you can think of it like masking. All right. Uh, final topic here, just bear with me for a couple more minutes, is Boolean operations. Boolean operations are at the top menu. When you have two or more shapes selected at the same time, they must have two or more shapes. If there's only one, there's nothing to bool, I guess. So you must have two selected. Um, there are four main things, union, subtract, intersect, and exclude. I'm going to be honest, I literally always forget which one of these is which. I always get subtract and intersect mixed up. But the icons that they actually show you there are pretty representative of what's going to happen. Um, these four different things are basically going to tell you, I want to turn these two or more shapes into one shape. Um, how are they going to interact? Union is going to just make them um, one single kind of region. Subtract is going to remove one of the shapes from the other. It has to do with the ordering. Um, exclude, uh, sorry, intersect is going to be the intersection of the two shapes of the Venn diagram in the middle of the Venn diagram. And exclude is the opposite, where it shows you the rest of the Venn diagram. So really quick, we're just going to go ahead and show you this as well in this kind of demo page. These are what we just talked about. And then something to note is that as soon as you um, use the Boolean operation, it becomes one singular layer instead of two. But you can still open it up and move them. So. This leads to some kind of interesting properties that might not come up super organically with things like UI UX, but if I were to select both of these rectangles and say, modify their corner radius, I can still do that. I can still actually affect the two squares independently, um, even though they are inside of one union. And this is, I think, I think that's pretty unique to Figma. But if I were to you know, make this one really, really round, but the other one stays rectangular, I can do that. Or I can take the entire union and then change the corner radius there. And you know the difference there is that these like inner curves or inner corners um, are actually going to also be affected if I do the entire union, whereas if I select the two squares individually, that's going to stay sharp. It's not going to be modified. So the benefit, again, of having a union is that you can treat the whole object like one object instead of like multiple. So if I were to do things like, hey, I want to change the color of this, I want to change the stroke. Um, if I were to have both of these with a stroke, Separately, um, oh my gosh. Oh, you actually can't see them here. Um, so the stroke would actually not work the way that I want it to. Um, but if I have it as a stroke in the union, it's going to follow whatever edge or curve that I have indicated in the whole union as one shape. So yeah, union is going to do what you expect. It makes it into one shape. Subtract is going to take one of the two objects and subtract from the other. In this case, it keeps the bottom shape and subtracts the top from it. Yes? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can ununionize it. Um, I think that the easiest way to do so is just to drag them out of the group again. This is going to be a common feature in Figma. If you drag it out, it's going to do that. And then you have this kind of blank union object that doesn't need anything that you can go ahead and just delete. Yep. Cool. Subtract is going to basically subtract the region on top from the region on the bottom. So if I move this around, kind of functions like you might see a mask function. It's going to um, just hide the sections that I'm hovering over. Intersect, same idea. Um, and something I want to note here is that there are two squares um, that are the same as the other examples, but the size of this object has changed to just the intersection point. Um, so if I were to move these as well, I can make the intersection size bigger, I can make it smaller, it can be nothing at all. Um, but when I select it by itself, it's going to be the height and the width of just that particular square. Again, excludes the same idea. It won't affect the size as much because it's going to be what you expect, but it gives you this cool illusion that we did also see earlier with the triangles as we were kind of modifying um, their vector networks. So any questions about these four kinds of Boolean operations?
Well, they caught question earlier about how to like un boolean operate them. You can just select the layers that are inside and drag them out, um, and that should do what you need it to do. Um, otherwise, I don't, I don't actually think there's another way to do this. Um, and while I'm here, while I'm going to show you that menu I just talked about, um, if you see this, if you see flatten selection, what, uh, sorry, question? Um, with flatten selection, what's going to do is just collapse these into one singular vector. So if I click this, there's now no drop down here. There's no large group. I can't interact with the two squares separately anymore. This is just straight up one shape. Um, flattening selection is also going to be helpful for things like if I want um, you know, a lot of different vectors to become one, even if I'm not doing Boolean operations, if I just have a bunch of squares that are overlapped, um, I can go ahead and just flatten them, and it's going to give me the one vector that I'm looking for. So the thing to note is that it might automatically apply Boolean operations to it, like you saw here. But it's not a problem if I don't want them. I can go ahead um, and go into the paint bucket tool like I would before and just change them to be filled in. You have a question? Uh, yes, they do. They do become the same color. Because otherwise, you'd have to kind of pick which of these two things, uh, which of the two colors you would choose. So by union them, it's just going to pick one of the two colors and make it um, that, because otherwise it doesn't really know where to change the colors. So we have the photos. Yeah, if you union photos, what it's going to do is make it one shape that is one of the photos. So it'll pick probably the, the bottom one. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions about any of this? Cool. I'm, I'm going to be, be honest, honest, I rarely ever use these. It's just something that is helpful to know. You might use it a lot in your drawing process or in your illustration process, especially if this is something that's like emblematic of your style. Um, it also creates a lot of pretty cool and funky um, shapes that you um, can play with a lot, like with the stroke. Um, I really like the way that it kind of appears in this way. Again, kind of exemplifying the stroke idea, you can see more obviously how the outside, center, and inside actually change the whole look of the object. Um, with, with something, something like an um, exclusion or with something like a union. Um, but it is handy to know. It's something that you can't Google if you are unsure how to do this again in the future. Um, but that's basically all for today. So we've done the demo. We're going to go ahead and wrap up. Any last minute questions about anything we talked about with user research, user testing, vector networks, or Boolean operations? Sweet. OK. So um, this week's homework is also one of my favorites. I really like this one. It's basically just trace a messenger sticker that you like. Any sticker that you want, um, you'll get a chance to kind of make it your own. Um, and again, tracing is genuinely the best way to learn how to do vectors. I don't think there's any other thing that you can do that will kind of teach you the intuition a little bit better. Obviously, do not ever trace somebody's work and call your owner or will yell at you and be very mad. Uh, but in this case, it's just sort of homework, so don't worry about it. Tracing is a great way to learn. And in this like lab, you're also going to be doing a couple of um, basic kind of exercises or drills and how to get comfortable with the tools. And then we'll be doing basic shapes here um, with all of these kind of fruit illustrations as well. The secret word for today, um, what did we say it was going to be? We've forgotten. The secret word of the day will be onion, because the example here is an onion. That's O-N-I-O-N, um, which I guess you can't guess if you didn't watch this lecture, so that works out. Um, the secret word is onion, and then the only announcements for this week are just to keep an eye out for the homeworks and the readings and the lab as well, and they should all be on B courses um, now as well. And the last thing, um, just as a little bit of a heads up, the midterm is going to be announced next week. You're going to have two weeks to work on it. During those two weeks, you won't have any homework. Um, but do get excited. I think it's a pretty fun midterm. Um, there's not really any um, really strong restrictions on it. You can kind of do whatever you want, given the prompt that we have. Thank you all so much for coming today, and I will see you next week to talk about prototyping. Thank you. Thank you.